Welcome to another episode of Systematic Geekology. This is a space where we seek to create and cultivate healthy conversations between those things we geek out on and the philosophical and theological questions that often arise out of our fandoms. Like, what does it mean to be human? What makes a hero? What makes a villain? How do the stories and narratives we geek out on shape how we live in the world? We are your priest to the geeks. We aren't all ordained, but we see ourselves as mediators at the intersection of geek culture and going deeper in our faith. We don't always have to agree, but we do respect each other, and we see everyone as a beloved child of God. Everyone geeks out on something, so come geek out with us and enjoy the show. You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Could Taylor Swift help you pray better? <laughs> and do you care what what some some Christian podcasters or theologians or priests think of Taylor Swift's newest album? Well, if you do, this is the perfect episode for you. Guys, today we will be discussing and reviewing Taylor Swift's newest album, The Tortured Poets Department. Uh, that might be the first time that I said it right. I always want to say Torture Poets Society for some reason, but it is Torture Poets Department. <laughs> Guys, uh, this is going to be a fantastic episode. This was kind of like a last minute thing. Like T Swift dropped this idea that she's going to drop an album. And I immediately texted my favorite Swifties that I know, um, which which aren't young girls, but rather some bearded theologians um, <laughs> and, and one of their wives. I was like, hey, guys, let's jump on. And let's talk about T Swift. And of course, their reaction was immediately, "Hell yeah, we're talking about T Swift." <laughs> oh man, y'all, we we realize this is a little bit outside of like maybe people's expectations. Um, but I think it's going to be a fun episode. We're going to talk some about like the theology of like how we think about psalms and songs. We're going to talk about Taylor Swift's album and what is fun about it, what's not fun about it, what we love, what we didn't love, uh, how we feel about Taylor Swift's music in general. Um, and we're, we're honestly, we're just going to hang out and have a good time. I'm here. I'm Joshua Nolan, one of your hosts. I'm here with former host and expert guest, uh, maybe the most common guest, Brandon Knight, um, the, the host of My Seminary Life. I should have done Hi. applause. Wait a minute. Let, let, me, let me, I can try that again. You have a soundboard? The host of My Seminary Life. Wow. Check that out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, also here with his wife, uh, Claire Knight. Hello. <laughs> and uh, your 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 favorite one of your favorite guests, uh, the your favorite Orthodox returning guest. I think that's that's probably accurate for this show. Uh, Father Jonathan of the Holy Trinity Orthodox Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. I say church; it's cathedral, right? Yeah, Trinity, it's a cathedral. Orthodox Cathedral. Yeah, um, and he was on before uh, for a very uh, closely related episode talking about D and D, which is pretty much the same thing as Taylor Swift. <laughs> Welcome back, man. It's just as complicated. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I, if you can't tell, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm feeling really goofy for this episode. I, and yeah, I'm, I'm drinking a beer, guys. I'm having a prenup peanut butter from uh, Legal Remedy Brewery. Why am I telling you this? Because if you care about theology, fun, and beer, then you can go to Theology Beer Camp 2024 in Denver, Colorado, uh, and you can meet some of us there, myself specifically. Um <laughs> You can have some you can have a beer with me, talk theology and nerd stuff. We're going to be running a geek stage down there. Um, yeah. So check it out and use the code Geekshire, all one word, G-E-E-K-S-H-I-R-E. You get a discount. You help the show and you get to go hang out with us and talk nerd and theology. It'll be good stuff. So make sure you check us out over there. If you're listening to this on the podcast, rate and review. If you're on YouTube, smash the like and subscribe button or else you're smashing Will's heart and no one wants to do that. Cause that's just mean. Will's so kind. You might as well smash that like button and subscribe. Um, and we're going to shout out a 
supporter of the show real quick, Jeannie Mattingly. Thank you so much for sponsoring our show. You rock with that guys real quick. Uh, we're not going to do what you're geeking out on other than this album. What music are you listening to lately? Brandon? Uh, I have been listening to a group called liturgical folk. They do, um, they write hymns and do, uh, psalms, blessings, and prayers that are in the Catholic Church, but they set Ooh. them to like that folk Americana style music. So that's been interesting. It's been good. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Claire, what about you? What uh, other than Taylor Swift? What have you been listening to lately? That's that, that's it. That's more Taylor it. Swift. <laughs> no, <laughs> extra um, Taylor. I Swift. actually uh, have been listening a lot to a lot of um, Citizens. It's a Christian band, but not lame i guess you could say um i don't know i like, I like their that. sound yeah so yeah what's weird is like i felt that way when ren collective first started getting popular and it's funny because it's like it's very christian but i think part of it is like it wasn't apologetic about it like a lot of modern christian music it's almost like apologizing for being christian music like it's trying to sound like it's not christian music and i like that ren collective was like nah this is christian we're gonna sound christian and it's fine <laughs> <laughs> they're just honest about it you know don't this try to fool me into thinking this is rap <laughs> <laughs> sorry father Jonathan, what have you been listening to lately other than uh, taylor swift there's nothing in, per- in particular i found like this uh, like i clicked on like a, a cover uh of, of some band i don't know what it was in particular the first time and now my youtube um algorithm is like flooded with these covers so i just mm. like i keep listening to these playlists of of covers on youtube oh, man one one of my favorites um this is super, this is a little bit random in scrubs uh at the janitor's wedding they do an acoustic version of um hey now <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like it sounds like a real love song until he gets the um hey ladies what's colder than cool <laughs> and they're like oh okay this is not a real <laughs> acoustic love song that's awesome uh, yeah no it's, it's fantastic uh, lately i've been listening to noah khan uh talking about that like americana folk music i, sure. I really like his stuff it, it's like if passenger was american so a little less artistic <laughs> a little bit more angry and sometimes I vibe with that. Sometimes I am a little bit more angry than Passenger is. <laughs> He's my favorite artist. But sometimes I'm like, ah, listen, man, you're not angry enough at the world. <laughs> you should be angrier. Yeah. Come on. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and it's really funny because he actually wrote a song specifically talking about like how Donald Trump is like the worst. And it still just didn't feel that angry. It just felt like him saying this guy is bad. And I'm like, OK, but like, are you mad about it, though? <laughs> you mad about it? Come on. <laughs> Oh, man. Anyway, with that, let's jump into today's episode. We're going to talk about Taylor Swift, uh, the Torture Poets Department. Um, I'm excited for this. Before we get too far into it, though, um, what like we talked about, like what we're listening to recently. But like as far as like genre goes, is there like a genre of music that's like typically what you gravitate towards? Um, I think mine's pretty obvious. I'll just go ahead and start because like. I mentioned Passenger Noah Khan. Like, I like that folky Americana. When I first started working at Chipotle, uh, there was like a joke about like, they like made memes of me because I was always in the back doing dishes, listening to the saddest songs. And it's true. I love, I love doing dishes, listening to sad songs. Like, I think it's great. I thought you were going to say that you were vibing to the music that they play at Chipotle's, which is by no. far the weirdest music out there. <laughs> Chipotle's have the that weirdest. That is accurate restaurant music I chipotle on sunday and they had that music up like it was a club i was like <laughs> what is going on in here it is the middle of the lunch rush there's one for some reason that only happens at night sorry i work at chipotle for those who don't know and for some reason it only happens at night and like it's literally just them going what? <laughs> like what is this? this is just someone screaming that's all this is fantastic yeah it's awful uh brandon other than just random screaming at Chipotle, what kind of genre of music do you typically gravitate to? Typically, I do not listen to the like pop stuff that like kind of Taylor Swift. I do like Taylor Swift, but I'm usually more on the alternative side of things, a little bit more like a pop punk emo kid. So uh, My Chemical Romance, Green Day, 
uh, Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco, even like uh, grunge, like uh, Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Nirvana, things like that. Ooh. Which Brandon just wanted to list the best musical artists of the 90s. That's right. all. <laughs> Basically, he, he got the wrong question, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, Taylor Swift does do a song with Florence from Florence and the Machine on this album, mm -hmm. who also would be a part of that, like alternative scene. And she's done a lot of like done work with a lot of alternative artists. So I'm I'm ready for the oh. Taylor Swift pop punk album. Oh, man, I actually like the song she did with the Panic of the Disco guy, even though. He's Brendan making I for love good that reasons. song. I don't care what anyone yeah. says. Me too. I also really enjoy it. That, that's me, right? That's like the name's yeah. me. I, I love yeah. that one. Um, I, man, man. Yeah. Good stuff. I, I, was, I was trying to think. Oh, I, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm actually really non-discriminatory. Really? I was thinking about it. Cause like, I don't not listen to pop. Um, I actually just last year discovered Sugar Ray because I wasn't allowed to listen to music that wasn't Christian growing up. Okay. Or was the year before? It was very recently. I love him though. I've been on a binge. For me, it's new music. So it's like this is great. Everybody else is like Josh. That got old ten years ago or twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, Father Jonathan, what's like? What do you typically gravitate towards as far as like music genres and stuff? Um, I don't know what like what, what genre genre to fall into, but I like like um, I really was into Mumford and Sons for a long time. So I guess like kind of yeah. kind of bulky semi spiritual type music uh bon ivor um a, a lot of the 90s stuff that was already mentioned um i mean that's what i listened to when i was growing up um early 2000s um like early 2000s rock and stuff like that um foo fighters i was really big into foo fighters for at, like we in various foo song stages Man, good stuff. Yeah, we played yeah. Food Fighter song at my wedding. Also, uh, the um, Bon Iver song uh, with Taylor Swift, the "Exile," one mm. of my favorite Taylor Swift songs. It's so good. Yeah, um, Claire, what's the what kind of genre do you typically gravitate towards? Um, t Taylor Swift. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's definitely um a lot of pop. I love Claire's music. role in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I just like Taylor Swift because like. I mean, she's she makes different genres of music, so duh. Oh, yeah. Anyway, um, someone said one time that she's like she is the music industry because she touches every aspect of it, every genre. Yeah, um, I mean, they're not wrong. I do like listening to a lot of pop from like when I was like a like a kid. Sugar Ray. I'll put on like pop from the twenty two thousands and two thousand tens. Sugar Ray. <laughs> Not Sugar Ray, so sorry. Aww. Um, I like Lady Gaga a lot. She's good. Oh, that's fair. I like Olivia Rodrigo. Mostly popular artists, but you know, I'm also into pop punk. Grew up listening to yeah. Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco. Oh, man, I I'm gonna throw out one of my, you know, you know, I, I according to Christian Ashley, I'm entitled to at least one bad opinion per episode. And according um, to Joe, it's, it's Day, in the it's name. Nothing but bad opinions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, be prepared for just awful opinions at this moment forward. Fantastic. I did not like the song she did with Florence Pugh, and I I was so upset because like in my mind, I'm going to this album and there's a song called Florida, and I'm like, hold up, that's my state. I love Florida. All I wanted was to love that song because Taylor Swift's talking about my state. Like, that's where I grew up. It's like my favorite place to be. And I'm like, this song kind of sucks. Like, I just did not like it. That's a bad thing. It is. <laughs> I, I like the Taylor Swift part. And as soon as the the other lady started singing, I was like, I don't want to listen to the rest of this you track. <laughs> you don't like Florence and the Machine? I I like other songs they did, but for some reason in that song, I've just like I've tried like three or four times because I want to convince myself. I'm trying to gaslight myself into liking it, but I just can't yet. <laughs> it's if sad. you can't gaslight yourself into liking it, maybe you can try hypnotizing yourself. I'll gaslight you. I need something. <laughs> maybe maybe I can get Father Jonathan to pray for me until I'm, I like. <laughs> I'll pray for you, song. honestly. <laughs> What's so funny is like. My wife likes it a lot. She likes that song a lot. And I'm like, man, 
I really wish I did. Cause like we go camping and like this island off the Florida, Georgia coast every year. And like, I create a playlist and I was like, oh, I can't wait. I'm going to put the song Florida on there. And let's do it. Like, it's not, it's not going to make it to the playlist. It's just not, mm, not doing it. They say Florida a couple of times in Fortnite. So maybe, maybe yeah, I think like- that one's going to make it. Cause I, I did like Fortnite. Fortnite was good. Is that, <laughs> I thought Claire thought told me that was a bad opinion too. Like that's also wrong. <laughs> <laughs> brace brace for impact <laughs> just, just waiting for it you know the reason oh, why man. florida is mentioned so much is because between the florida and like texas shows it's kind of when like joe's uh the breakup with joe became like public <sighs> and all that stuff so that's why oh i think that's why there's a lot of makes sense. mention of florida i wonder if it had it i was wondering if it had anything to do with matt healy i was like does he have a connection to florida somehow that i just don't know about Hmm. anyway so that that makes sense i am going to go back to that in a little bit but first i want to talk specifically our history with taylor swift's music um let's let's let claire start claire has been waiting to talk about taylor swift so when did you did you just always oh, she's not waiting taylor swift or she just talks taylor swift <laughs> <laughs> she just gets to do it with on a podcast now yeah you know, like a microphone to talk about it now it's very exciting <clears throat> I actually the first album that I listened to like in its entirety was 1989. So um, that's what kind of got me into it first. And like I, you know, heard some of her like the very mainstream songs and I never disliked them. But 1989 was the first time I was like, oh, who is this Taylor Swift? Let me listen to her some more. But then, of course, she, you know, went on a however many year hiatus after 1989 so um mm-hmm. my favorite album is reputation uh but i don't know now i just listen to all of it i have a playlist that is just it's just every single taylor swift song so that i Perfect. can just put it on shuffle and like i don't know i just like that she's got so many different like with the different genres or different like moods of the songs like i feel like i can find no matter like what kind of music mood I'm in, unless it's like pop punk or something like I can find something that she sings that fits my Mm -hmm. mood. So like, why do I need to listen to anything else? You know? (laughs) (laughs) All right. That checks out, I guess. Um, Father Jonathan, how about, how about you? Like, like you mentioned on the whole church podcast, this is how this started. You mentioned that you were a Swifty and I was like, I, I need to know more about this. Father yeah. Jonathan just like be vibing with Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it goes back to the beginning. I think I like, I think I somehow got connected to like one of like one of the songs from her first album, the, like the, like the self name one. Um, and I started listening to it and then, um, um, so I, 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 no, I wasn't like a, like a super fan or anything back then, but I, you know, I like the songs. I, 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 I'm always someone who appreciates, good storytelling in music and like she has a very a beautiful ability to to tell a story um that that can connect to to people mm-hmm. so you know even though it was like angsty like 15 year old girl um music uh, <laughs> uh in that first few those first couple of albums uh mm-hmm. i still found it very very great and i think what really did it for me is there was one summer um uh must have been must have been the Speak Now album because I um I was I was in I went on a pilgrimage as part of like seminary. It was like right after we gra- I graduated um uh with my my Master of Divinity. And uh, they, they send us on a pilgrimage. We started in Paris and then made our way eventually to Greece. Um and we were in Greece for like a month and a half, and then we went to Turkey, and then I went to uh, Palestine. Uh, where my my good friend got married. I was the best man at his wedding, which we happened to be in Bethlehem. Uh, and so I was gone for like three months, uh, one really- summer. And uh, I was in Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh, that was like our longest stay in one place in Greece. We, I was taking classes in Greek at the Univers- Aristotle University, which is in Thessaloniki. And I just had like a, like a month and a half, two months since I'd been there. And, um, and I just found myself like kind of, nostalgic homesick um 
even though I was with like a group of my, some of my best friends, like the, my friend who was getting married and my other friend who ended up being the best man at his wedding too. We were all there together. Uh, and it was, it was great, but, uh, you know, so I, I, I think I, I started listening to the album and then like I had a bunch of the music videos that I was listening to and like it was, I had missed because because that that year uh, she was on tour for that album and I had missed the Boston show because I'm from I'm originally from just outside of Boston uh, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to see her because I was going to be in Greece that whole time, but I was coming back in time to make the Philadelphia show. And so I bought tickets while I was in Greece and I like asked my cousin who was in med school in Philadelphia if she wanted to go with me. And so we went, we got floor seats at uh, the Eagle Stadium. And the, the best part was it was like at that time, early enough in her career where most of her fans were like teenage girls and I'm like six, six foot. And so I'm standing floor <laughs> level at a sea of like 12 13 year old girls so i'm like a foot taller than everyone so i had like a perfect view <laughs> and she like and and we were right by the secondary stage when she would do those like acoustic sets in the back and so i was like 20 feet away from her great uh and then she walked by like within like six feet of me which was really cool um oh, and i was just like it was a great experience and it was like it was a it was an album that i really connected with and then um uh i think early it uh, might have been a little bit earlier like an earlier album that um um like I, I i connected with some of the lyrics as like i was getting into a new relationship and then that relationship like abruptly ended and it was a relationship where we both like taylor swift and then like all of a sudden the other half of the album started to hit me in the fields mm. um and then i think yeah. it's it's, yeah, it's carried me it's carried me through uh a couple breakups uh including my most recent one and uh um and, and now I can listen to those albums and it like, I think like hours really like hit me because it was like that. Um, I, you know, I had like some of the experience she described in that song were ones that I have with the, the, the girlfriend I had at the time. Uh, and then the relationship had ended and, um, and I just, I just remember like listening to it and it's like, I totally get this whole experience. And now I listen back and like I, I, my mind goes there sometimes. My mind goes to like other relationships that I had. And there's a nostalgia that it like her music brings to me. Um, just from like all the experiences I had in all the places around the world that I've been when I listen to her. And then also just kind of the stories that she tells that not in every way, but in many ways um, uh, resonate with my own experiences. Hmm. Yeah. Brandon, could you cover your first reaction with Taylor Swift? I know we're here to talk about Taylor Swift, but like Father Jonathan's whole flex about going on a pilgrimage and going around Europe on a pilgrimage and learning Greek where you should probably learn Greek was all very like, ah, I wish I had that anyway. So for me, when it comes to the Swifty stuff, I was a little bit more of like that stereotype. Well, for first off, wasn't really into country music still really not into country music unless it's like in the form of Johnny Cash or something. So like mm -hmm. the really early Taylor Swift never really other than like the radio hit stuff never really like caught my attention. But I sadly I was that stereotypical guy who was like Taylor Swift is for girls. I will listen to other stuff that is for boys because apparently music can be gendered. It shouldn't be but we sadly do that. And but it stopped being gendered when I was in college. And it was probably because I was around a lot of healthier people. I had healthier people in my life by that point. Uh, I was in college when Red and 1989 came out. Um, it was like the beginning of college was when Red came out. And it was the end of college when 1989 came out. And uh, I just remember like everybody liked taylor swift and i was like oh i i can be i can like listen to any i can listen to this and like i won't be judged for it and that's kind of cool because this you know red was the album where it shifted to more of like the the pop sound and especially at, at 1989 is when it shifted more pop and away from the country sound and i was really enjoying the music then so I was like, okay, cool. Now I can start listening to this, this music and be, and you know, again, I shouldn't have never have thought that way, but I do think a lot of guys kind of had that mentality early on and 
have kept up with the Taylor Swift music ever since, especially since Claire is such a big Swifty. You actually didn't mention your <laughs> Taylor Swift news for later this year. Oh, yeah. I'm going to the Eras tour. In wow. Indianapolis. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. My wife I got to go when it was in Nashville. The amount of money that I paid for the ticket because Brandon doesn't want to know. So that that's fair <laughs> i understand that because you can only get four tickets i sadly will not be oh. going uh i was the odd I'm man sorry. out but I, we did go see the uh, Eras tour concert movie when it was in theaters and then we have watched the <sighs> taylor's version on disney plus i still think it's silly oh, but i understand why because apparently it was like a rating issue thing because she drops f-bombs in her music but uh so i've seen the concert movie version but she does get yeah. to go in November. actually something my my wife mentioned that was really interesting to me is how taylor went from like not saying any bad words to now all of her explicit songs are explicit but specifically because she drops the f-bomb like she doesn't use other swear words that much but she likes that word for some she reason does. <laughs> it's a powerful word yeah yeah i mean i personally don't have anything wrong with it uh you know i'm not gonna say it on a live stream because you know people haven't been warned on youtube there wasn't an explicit rating they, they need to be warned before i <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, if, he could, if he could warn them he would say it so much yeah yeah every other word <laughs> Don't worry, because there's going to be this episode, Josh's version, where he yeah, I'll have Josh's version, F and it's just going to like, I'm just going to edit in myself going F, F, F. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I this is like I have such a weird history with Taylor Swift. I feel like I, I remember like appreciating her but not really like being super into it early on. Um, even like our love song was the first one I remember thinking was like just a fantastic song. I was really into that one. Um, I enjoyed that one a lot, um, but it wasn't until 1989 came out. I was living in Charleston. I was in college at the time and it wasn't quite as a joke, but it was all like, I don't know how to, how to explain this. It was a bit, there was a whole bit around me getting the 1989 album um, because a, at, at the time, I was one of those who's just really irritated that there's this expectation that men aren't supposed to like fun pop music by Taylor Swift or anything like that. It was only for girls. I'm like, actually, some of this is pretty good. And I don't like when expectations are put on me. So I immediately have to destroy them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then pair that with the Bible study I had going at the time when I was in Charleston involved one guy named Lee who I could not explain to you why there's like they, I literally just couldn't explain to you but people would just see him and for some reason assume he was racist it happened pretty frequently it made no sense to any of us and one of our other friends who everyone like like he he was a African man who dressed like he was from certain kind of neighborhoods so everyone made those kind of assumptions about him and we said you know it'd be fun if us three went together at midnight when 1989 drops to Walmart and we just bought that album and blared it in our car because no one would expect this particular group of people a to be together at all or B to be listening to Taylor Swift. So we just kind of did it for the bit and um, we went in and we all jammed. We loved that album. I was so glad it was good because if you stay up to midnight and you're like doing this whole thing for a bit and then like the music sucked, that would have been awful. <laughs> Yeah, but like we went in, we all loved it. It was a great album. I still love that album. Into the Woods was great. Um, we had a role playing game that uh, out of the wood. Thank you. Uh, we had a role playing game where where there's a certain character storyline measure like lined up so perfectly to the song Bad Blood um, that we were able to play it while doing basically Dungeons and Dragons. We played that song and everyone was like, oh, my God, this makes perfect sense. <laughs> Like, like, like the bullet hole lines and everything. Everyone's like, wait a minute. All of this happened. And we're like, yeah, Taylor Swift knows about the game, guys. <laughs> like, it was perfect. It was so much fun. Um, and then, yeah, like you mentioned, I, at the time, I still don't really follow Taylor Swift's life. I just liked her music. You know, my wife follows a little bit more of her life. So I'm a little bit more cued in now to like what some of the songs mean. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember there was like, it was a long time. Um, I, I wasn't a huge fan of rep. Like for me, it was just kind of, eh, for some reason I want passenger to be angry, but when Taylor gets angry, I'm like, eh, I don't care about that anger. 
You don't think about the I things I'm angry about. Second bad opinion in, in someone's <laughs> eyes. I could see it in her face. <laughs> I'm just dropping bad opinions like they're hot. Um, but, but the um, yeah, yeah. Then folklore. When folklore came out, mm. I went from casual Taylor fan, which I think I'm still a casual fan, but. I listen to that album religiously. I love that album. Invisible Strings is like, I listen to that probably at least once a week. I think that song is just mm. phenomenal. It hits me in all the right, like, like that, that song is like, man, I sound weird, but if I say vibe, but like I vibe with that so much. I'm like, that song is like, it's connected to me on a spiritual level. And I'm like, this is, this is good. This is good stuff. So yeah. Do you, yeah, do you yeah. feel the same way about Evermore or is it very specifically folklore? I, I like Evermore. But I didn't love it like I loved folklore. Like I love folklore. Evermore I liked. But I didn't love it. Gotcha. Sorry, Claire. <laughs> Claire's like, wow, this guy has bad opinion. No, it's okay. She's like, man, you Joe was right. All of his like, opinions oh, suck. Okay. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, so <laughs> that out of the way. Um, what let's go just straight to the album. Um, the Torture Poets Department. What was your first reaction to this one, Father Jonathan? What was your first thoughts when you listened to this album? Um, so I, I listened to it first of all. I was like super frustrated because I like I I like I happened to be up when it when it came out, and so I downloaded it. And then like the next day, I like the second part of the album dropped. <laughs> so I had to buy two <laughs> albums, which is fine. It's fine. Uh, but I remember, so I, the first song is Fortnite and I'm like, it had this like Lana Del Rey vibe to it. And like, even in the, like, like the, like the tone of it. And, um, and I don't think I ever actually heard like Post Malone sing and I was like really surprised by it. And so kind of going into it, I had this like moment of like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this because it's kind of got like a different vibe, but like, um, but then it kind of like reminded me a little bit of like snow at the beach, snow on the beach. Is that the one? Yeah, that she did with Lana Del Rey and just kind of like the, the tone and the enunciation. And as I moved into it, I, like I just I felt it was it, it each one struck me and like I could definitely feel a lot of the feelings along with it, even though like I couldn't I couldn't quite like I'm not at a place in life where like all of that resonates with me. But um, um, but but I I had an experience where like I could definitely um i felt like i was listening to people that like come to me uh for spiritual guidance and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and like um and like the types of feelings that they describe to me and yeah. um and, like, like i i may not have had those experiences that she's describing in the different in the different songs but i've definitely felt what those feelings feel like and so um so there was a resonance there despite maybe having mm -hmm. less uh less of the same experiences that she's describing as I, maybe I have in previous albums. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know systematic ecology has a YouTube channel? Now you do. And while you're there, you can see exclusive stuff like our comic book catch-up series, manga mustard drinks with Tejas, the companion series to our annual theme. You can go Friday night frights with me where I go through cryptozoology, ufology, and more. You can also go to see Spidey swing buys where I'm doing every chronological appearance by release of Spider-Man from amazing fantasy 15, all the way to the modern age. You can also find exclusive shorts on YouTube there, uh, as well as other bonuses for extra episodes that we do that don't end up on the podcast proper. So I want to see you over there on YouTube. So for me, I, because my wife was staying up anyway, very intentionally stayed up till midnight to listen to this thing. I was like, this is going to be great. Right. Um, and she'd been dropping hints about two forever. And for some reason, we, we had these, this idea that two, because a fortnight is two weeks. We were like, oh, in two weeks, she's going to do something. We were wrong, but whatever. Because mm -hmm. Taylor Swift, like it was said on some, somewhere, like I saw a meme that was like, if Taylor, we're just all should be glad Taylor Swift is an artist and not a serial killer. And I'm like, that's true. Because yeah. like, the, like, the, like the way she does like details mm -hmm. and stuff, you're like, mm. she, she probably as could know. be. As <laughs> yeah, as far as we know. I would really like to uh, read like a book or a comic That's book the fanfic we all her. really need. <laughs> Yeah, Taylor Swift the serial killer. Well, like, like, like no body, no crime. But yeah, that's a very know how it would happen. <laughs> that should be our next album. <laughs> or out of um, the woods, that, like allegedly. No, that 
Yes, if there's the supposedly supposedly hints in some of her songs that Taylor Swift and Harry Styles committed vehicular manslaughter and have covered it up. I am that sorry, a, we just got you demonetized. Definitely that's fascinated. A, that's a um, that's a popular fan theory. Am I now an accomplice? Is that is that what? No, what? there's <laughs> millions of accomplices. If that's okay. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, yeah, where, where was I? Yeah, so when the first part came out at midnight, I, I was a little disappointed, mostly because like tortured poets department to me, I was like, this has got to be like folklore evermore happening again, because like just like the title, like it sounds like it's going to be artistic. It's going to be great. And I'm like, oh, this is just like diet midnights. <laughs> what, what's happening here? Interesting. Um. Cause I, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just didn't want all pop. And, and some of the songs in the first part, especially re-listening to it, I love. But if I'm just talking about my first initial reactions, I was like, man, this isn't folklore part two. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, then the next day, when I listened to the second mar- part, I was like, man, she saved the best part of the album for last. Uh, and then as I've re-listened to it a few more times, I'm like, okay, wait, there's songs I really like on both sides. I really appreciate. Still not one of my favorite albums, but. I really appreciate it. I, I, there's some songs I really love that are probably going to be my top Taylor songs later on. Um, I do this thing where like I overcorrect or I'm like, I'm so scared of recency bias that I just assume I don't like any of this until <laughs> recency has passed. <laughs> Brandon, you go. Do you want to go first? No, you go you, first. You go first. I was going to say the best for last. Brandon, so, <laughs> I'm saving the best for last. There we go. Uh, so I actually just finished listening to it before we got on perfect um, i'm also still very <laughs> confused as to how many songs and was it intentionally two albums and i'm still very confused about all of the detailed stuff um i know that <laughs> online there is i don't know if you've been keeping your ear to the ground but online there is a lot of discourse uh it's a very polarizing album it seems like there's people who hate it there's people who say it's her best album um i walked away from it thinking it was fine i i don't think there was really for me i don't think there was really anything like um like oh my gosh this is like a mind-blowing song and there wasn't really anything necessarily like oh this is trash like i don't like <laughs> all. what about the like, florida song no, I like the Florida song. I don't. You're wrong about that one, Josh. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, it's funny that you say that it's Diet Midnight. I was getting a little. I was getting more like 1989. With there was like one. Um, but Daddy, I love him. Was like, oh, there's a little bit of country kind of splashed yeah. in yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Country Taylor splashed in here, and that I did like how she kind of like splashed a little bit of her roots mm-hmm. in there. Even though, again, I don't really like country music. Um, it was <laughs> mentioned earlier by some of y'all that like, you know, the the songs that are about like the breakups were are like the ones that like really resonate with you. For me, like those songs are good. I'll, I'll share an unpopular opinion. The Taylor's version of the the We Hate Jake Gyllenhaal song the is it, the 10 minute version is incredibly too long. Um, but for me, it's, it's the songs about identity that have really connected with me. The, the Man is my favorite Taylor Swift song followed up by Antihero. Those are like my two favorite Ooh, songs. Oh, Those that's fair. Really I don't agree, but that's fair. <laughs> Oh, okay man. i'm sorry you don't agree with my favorite songs you tell me what my favorite songs are. <laughs> no no i mean like they're they're not my favorites but i'm like i definitely can see where you would resonate with those yeah like, that yeah. makes a lot of sense those are good songs and at least upon listening to it one time through now again i think it's perfectly it's fine um but bec- there wasn't really any songs that were like that identity focused at least upon the first listening that really caught my attention so when i go back and re-listen to it a few more times maybe one of them will stick out a little bit more um it's definitely not her worst i don't know if taylor swift has a bad album i mean again the country music one is just not my favorite style and she was young Mm -hmm. when she wrote it so like yeah it's gonna appeal to a very certain group and that's that's perfectly fine um yeah i would say the people who are saying that it is her best might be that might be a recency bias thing and i i definitely agree with you josh on the recency bias thing because 
for a, I, I really like 1989, but Midnight <laughs> like really got like I really liked Midnight's when it first came out. And I was like, no, this is just recency. But now I'm like, OK, no, I do really like this one, too. Yeah, I thought that I overreacted to Midnight's when I was like, I don't like this one. Um, and as time has passed, I realized I just don't like Midnight's that much. No. Yeah, I don't know why. It's not a particular reason. It's not like I'm like, oh, this one sucks. I just it just didn't click with me. I don't know why. Claire, <laughs> what are your thoughts on Torture Poets Department? <laughs> Initial okay, thoughts. Well, unlike you amateurs, I <laughs> knew that uh, Taylor Swift was going to do something in the middle of the night because that's just her style. And so I, knowing that this was middle going of to the be night. an emotional roller coaster, got a full night of sleep the night before so i could wake up rested and fully be able <laughs> to absorb this album because i knew it was gonna be smart smart rough which it was i got home i listened to it at work and stuff and i, I got home and i was exhausted it was like i was like i just feel like i'm emotionally spent um i will say i i personally like the first half better than the second um i feel like at there is a point in the second half where I was just like, hold on. And this might be, be just because it's the second half. And so I had listened to so many songs, but like, I just was like, is this a new song? Are we still singing the same song? Did she do another 10 <laughs> minute song? Oh yeah. Um, a few of them, but I really think run into each other. going back and like shuffling and listening to it on shuffle and not necessarily in order. I'm like, oh, OK, when it's not like four sad, slow songs in a row, I think mm. I like it a little bit more. I think it just got to a point where I was like, Taylor, I think I'm going to need some therapy after this. And <laughs> <laughs> can you oh, pay man. for my therapy? Jeez. Because you're a billionaire. So and you did this to That's me. True. She but is the music industry, as Father Jonathan she said. She is the music industry. Yeah. Um, that's now an ordained statement. I will <laughs> that's, say. That's a joke, everybody. <laughs> I will say I listened to um, the manuscript on the way home from Ooh. work. And it was like that I was texted uh, my future sister-in-law. And I was like, I feel like this song both broke and mended my heart at the same time like yes i don't know it's just like for some reason i like got done listening to it and i just sat in my car in silence That's for a little bit the final track right yes, yes. Like, yes. Final track. that one was just yeah. emotionally that one was rough to get through yeah. i'm like i am i supposed to feel sad happy what and i'm like this is torture poets department that's what it's about <laughs> Here's the thing. We all thought that we heard the title. Richard Poets Department and we all thought, oh, she's, you know, a student at Oxford and it's fall time. No, True. she was talking about a mental institution. We thought dark academia. She said mm. mental hospital. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So before going on, uh, and we, we've kind of hinted around this topic. Um, I want to get a little bit more before we, so here's how we're going to do the rest of this episode. And I know we're 42 minutes in and I just wanted an excuse to say 42. Sorry guys. Um, we're going to discuss like how we think about songs in general. Um, and then we're going to get into specifically, we want to talk about guilty as sin. I did because I think lyrically that's the one where if some people who, who, dabble in theology at all are going to talk about this album they have to talk about that song in my opinion oh they are um uh, then we're going to go through and this the, the hard part's going to be before we rate it zero out of ten we're going to go through and every one of us is going to pick two songs we're going to go through an order and every one of us gets two options to say stop i want to talk about that one so in total we're going to do eight songs we can't both pick the same song so we don't know who's going to pick what because we didn't go over it beforehand because i thought that would be more fun so if we go through the whole list and someone still has a song they haven't done, we might go back to a few. We'll see. Then we're going to rate it. And then we're going to wrap this up. So first, uh, as someone who's I, I personally, I'm very passionate about hermeneutics. It's something I, I spend a lot of time with. And that kind of just it's something I care a lot about. And that's like how we study the Bible, how we think about the Bible. And yes, this is a Christian podcast. so We got to throw this in there. And I'm sorry. We'll still talk about. Look at that. She's so pretty. Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> it's. <laughs> Um, the reason this is important, because when we think about songs, it, it brings me back to some of how I have wrestled with biblical Psalms. 
songs, psalms, they're basically the same thing. Hang in there with me, guys. Words are meant to miss here. Yeah. Um, because they're not. I I grew up Pentecostal and it's very feeling based, very spiritual based, that kind of stuff. And, and I feel like when I went to college, I kind of pushed against that so much. I became too studied, too intellectual based, if that makes sense. Um, and it wasn't until I came across a book by Donald Whitney praying the Bible. And he talks about going through the Psalms and saying, hey, yes, it does matter what the Psalms mean. Yes, it does matter the context that they happened in. but it's also okay and even good to just read the psalm and whatever you're feeling, pray to God about that. Because ultimately, songs and music and psalms, they're about feelings. So you don't have to say, oh, this biblical passage is about my grandpa because it made you think about your grandpa. Maybe all it said was the word fish. And that made you think of fishy. What made you think of your grandpa? That's not an accurate explanation. That's not an accurate exegesis. But it's still an important feeling that you should wrestle with. And having that permission to wrestle with the Psalms in that kind of way and study it and not not study it, but to just pray about it and to just feel it and it not have to all be in my head, but let some of it be feeling and more mystic based changed my world. And I think the same thing can happen with Taylor Swift songs. And I know that's annoying of me and I'm sorry. Um, But if you go to YouTube and you look up Taylor Swift, you're going to have a million videos of people who are better at us, this kind of stuff than we are, who are going to be like, wait a minute. She said this word here, which implies this thing about this relationship. And it means that in 2025, she's going to release this album on this date. And they might be right. They might have perfect theories and all this because Taylor Swift actually is a psychopath who puts a lot of detail into literally every single post and word she says. She's thought it all out. And it's not that those things don't matter. The context matters. Understanding who Matt Healy is actually does help a lot with this album. When you hear about like drugs and stuff and her lover, like it's like, okay, wait, that's what she's talking about. It does help you understand what she's talking about. But I think it's equally important that I have my own feelings and you have permission when some of these words happen that maybe has nothing to do with what the song's about triggers a feeling in me. It's okay to feel that thing. Um, even pray about it, talk to other people about it, and to just let the song be about something for you that maybe it wasn't about to the author. Um, Brandon, Jonathan, Claire, do any of y'all have any other thoughts of like how we interpret songs, psalms, that kind of stuff? And like, how do we wrestle with like the meaning of psalms, like what it actually means as opposed to what it means to us? And um, do you have any other comments you just want to throw in there? So um I don't know where the quote comes from, but the, it's, it, it has been said that the, the Psalms are the prayer book of the church. And uh, coming from a tradition mm-hmm. yeah. where like the majority of our prayers even are, are just like different verses from different Psalms strung together to create a different meaning. Uh, I've always told people like in pastoral care that like there, the beautiful thing about the book of Psalms, if you can just keep reading it, it helps you cultivate a language for prayer because every experience, every emotion that a human being can, mm-hmm. can feel is present in the Psalms. Um, anger, fear, betrayal, sorrow, joy, hope, uh, love, all of those things. Um, and so I, I never discourage people like from searching the Psalms for, um, for something that is meaningful, but also to help them cultivate a language. I, I tell people that like, oh, they don't, like people say, I don't know how to like pray extemporaneously. I'm like, well, just read the Psalms until you can. Um, and, um, but I like what the, Josh, what you said about like this, like having permission to experience the feelings. And, I, and in my pastoral ministry, so much of what I do, because even though like we do it, we have a, a, a tradition of confession in the Orthodox Church, but I always see it as soul therapy more than anything else. I'm not there to listen to the things that people did wrong. I'm look, I'm there to help them discover their wounds and traumas and provide them with uh, pastoral care to help heal those wounds. Um, and a lot of what I, I, I say to most people is your feelings are always real but the stories you tell yourself about them might not be true. Um, And and so if there is something that strikes you in music and and there's a feeling there, like that is a, that is an invitation for you to delve deep in your interior life and explore 
Is it, a, is it a joyful feeling or is it a sorrowful feeling? Does it elicit anger? What's that anger trying to protect you from? What, what deeper wound maybe is that anger trying to protect you from? Um, and so if a song has the capacity to do that, uh, I think it doesn't matter who it's by uh, and what the context is, even if it's about something completely different, it is an invitation for you to, to, to explore your interior life. Mm. Yeah. I'll hop in. So I do know that Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book on the Psalms is called Prayer Book of the Bible, just to kind of continue to double down on this idea of like the value of praying Psalms and sitting in them to help you uh, process what you're feeling. Because, um, you know, one of the many talking heads that we have heard on TikTok talk about this album has talk, was going into about how you know, looking at this album in particular, tor Torture Poets, it's it's a bunch of complicated feelings. You know, maybe Taylor Swift wasn't trying to write the next, you know, uh, Grammy winning album. She has enough of those awards anyway. But maybe this was just a cathartic experience for her. And um, I think the Psalms can definitely be a cathartic can we can find a cathartic experience by sitting in them and praying yeah. them and wrestling with them um i'm gonna also circle back to one thing you said josh because author original intent is very is something that for me is very important and mm -hmm. we we are in a time where that's not as important what i am thinking or experiencing about a thing that is what it is about you know and that's it it is important especially if you are having some kind of like religious experience with a form of art to validate that and to grow from it but we do have to remember what the author of the art the creator of the art what they were trying to communicate in that as well so i'll just use my favorite taylor swift song as an example the man so this is a song for those of you who don't know it's on the lover album uh, this is a song about her, like her experience in the music industry as a woman and all of the like extra hoops and extra labor that she has to go through in order to be on top. And that, you know, it would be so much easier if she was a man like that's what it now you might be sitting there thinking, how in the world is this your favorite song, Brandon? You're not in the music industry and everyone's happy about it and you're a man. So how is this like your favorite song? <laughs> and it's because being a guy in the evangelical white American evangelical church where they, you know, there's a certain model of masculinity that is held up this like very traditional conservative 1950s man who you know, goes to work full time, hunts and fishes for fun, you know, all this like very stereotypical stuff is often what's lifted up as like, man, that's not me. I'm a stay at home dad. I have a part time job where I'm literally a ninja coach. Mm -hmm. I do most of the cooking and cleaning during the week. I, I don't hunt and fish and go camping for fun. That most of those yeah. things sound miserable to me. I, I, you know, <laughs> I do other things for fun. Yeah. And when culture and secular culture in general is saying one thing is masculine and the church environment you're in is saying this is what is masculine. But then you have a song over here that's saying, hey, I wish I was a, a man because this would be so much simpler. I connected with it. But I can't say the man is a song about being a beta. That's not what the song is about. I can have this yeah. like experience of like, oh, I connect with this song because like I don't like live up. I don't like fulfill the stereotypical masculine views, but I cannot claim this song as my own, if that makes sense, because the Taylor's original purpose of the song was to be a voice for women in industries where men are usually get by easier yeah. so that's all i wanted to kind of like bring up is like yeah, yes yeah, that makes a lot of sense definitely have your emotional connection but we got to remember what the author originally meant by their art as well yeah no no i i like that point a lot um and it brings me you mentioned dietrich bonhoeffer i gotta mention uh c.s lewis it's i'm legally obligated i got a contract with the, with the dead um but <laughs> 
the Lewis Society will come for him. <laughs> What's funny is I actually have friends that's in the C.S. Lewis institution, but um, I don't think they claim me yet. Um, <laughs> the, no, he has a song. One of my favorites of his uh, books. Sorry, not songs. One of my favorite of C.S. Lewis books is the reflection of the on the Psalms. And it's just so random. Like, it's so outside of his wheelhouse. It's basically C.S. Lewis doing a commentary, but he's doing it as a literary expert because, you know, his scholarship isn't in religion. It's in literature. Um, and, and he brings out this idea of there being more than one truth. The psalm had its own truth. And then maybe there's a bigger truth. And he's talking about specifically like psalms that we now see as like, oh, that was about Jesus. Well, clearly, the author didn't mean it to be about Jesus. And what the author meant was true on its own. But also there's a bigger truth that the author didn't know about that can be applicable to Jesus. But I use that even like thinking more of like um, the psalm. There's a psalm that's uh, how blessed are those who take their babies and throw it against the rocks. I think there was a truth and how pissed off the Israelites were at what happened to them and that they had a right to be pissed off. And I don't think that that just because that is the truth and that's what's meant by the psalm doesn't mean that I can read that. And be angry at something else and it make me feel better. And that's like, oh, that's wrong of you. You weren't being oppressed by Palestinians. No, that's not the point, right? Like I could be mad about something else and still connect to this psalm and still not think that I'm literally supposed to hope people's babies die. Right? Like All of those things can be true. Um. Okay, Claire, did you have anything you wanted to add to this part of the conversation? Or do you want us to just get to the album already? You think we're taking I, too long? Um don't feel qualified to add anything to this part of the conversation that's fair i'm not qualified but i talk anyway i have a big mouth <laughs> i'm i'm just here for taylor <laughs> all right so on to taylor swift <laughs> we're gonna start we're gonna start by talking about guilty as sin Ah, uh, guys this for me this one it wasn't my favorite by any means I mean, this one's difficult. I'm going to share a Google screen so people can see the lyrics. We're going to talk about what happened to this psalm. This song, not psalm, sorry. <laughs> um, at first, you. from my understanding, uh, this song is about a couple different things. One being maybe masturbation. Um, another one being demonization. Again. How can it be sin oh, if... Line. If was it, how can I be guilty without ever touching his skin? How can I be guilty of sin? So if it's just something that happens in my mind, if it's just something that's happening in my thoughts, how can that be something that makes me guilty? Um, and that's something that she brought up as, oh, see, whatever, not this is common sense says that I can't be guilty for something that I haven't actually done. So just because I thought about it, just because something about her upper thigh, read into that what you will, only in her mind, you know, whatever. Um, so we have these things that seem like they're talking about something, but I think the big takeaway um, here, let me get back down to it. I want to read this. Um, let me, let's try, try and figure out. Okay. What if he's, I'm going to read this whole part of the lyric and it's going to sound weird coming from me guys. And I'm sorry. What if he's written mine on my upper thigh, only in my mind, one slip and falling back into the hedge maids. Oh, what a way to die. My bed, shit, my bed sheets are ablaze. I screamed his name, building up like waves, crashing over my grave. Without ever touching his skin, how can I be guilty of sin? What if I roll the stone away? They're going to crucify me anyway. What if the way you hold me is actually what's holy? If long-suffering propriety is what they want from me, they don't know how you've haunted me so stunningly. I choose you and me religiously. All right, guys, I, I don't think we can say that there's no theological implications here. I don't know if she's trying to teach theology. I don't think she is, but there's implications of how she feels and what she thinks theology is telling her. Um, go at it. You guys are smarter than me. Brandon, Father Jonathan, tell me something. How, how do you guys wrestle with what she said here? Well, I know this. Evangelical Facebook is already ablaze angry about this song. That it's yeah. what well, is it really? Yes, I haven't sir. heard anything yet. Yes, it <laughs> okay, is. Okay, good. We saw good it earlier. <laughs> it's, we saw it earlier. It's actually a lot of the album is being called blasphemous, um, partially because, as we mentioned er earlier, a lot of f bombs. Um, but uh, this song in particular, I forgot what other ones. There's a couple times throughout this album where she uses religious 
language or religious imagery and language in the songs. Uh, but this is one of the biggest offenders, I guess. Um, so yeah, I'll just put that one there of evangelical Christianity is already very, very mad about all this. Yeah, that checks I, out. I would like to co- contextualize it too, because they're like part of me just like looking like like what's happened in relationship to her in the news, especially the like right wing news that's maybe some of the those those groups are kind of keyed into. Um, like there was an anticipatory um, um, attention paid towards taylor swift like given the, the nature of what's coming up in the political realm and like the whole you know right-wing conservative media stuff uh, around her and travis kelsey and and like the super bowl and all of that and so i think that they're like i i don't know that this isn't the case that, like this is the case but i i do think that they're i think there was scrutiny was poised be, uh, already coming in uh, from certain groups, and so I'm not saying that's the only reason, or even if that's a like, is a reason, but I think um, that there was a part of me that like anticipated some pushback um, from certain circles, just in general, and I think the the language kind of gave 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 reason for it um, more than just like you know, if, if it was just like a lot of F-bombs and, um, and, you know, you know, yeah, normal breakup stuff like that. But I think that the fact that the like attention was already directed towards her, um, and what she was going to say or what she has been saying, um, and then, and then to use language that, I mean, it's just, it's uh, in, in many ways, it's just drawing from ideas, um, mm-hmm. religious ideas. But it's like not the first time that she's talked in a way of like, like love how so, love somehow being like sacramental in a certain way, um, yeah. uh, and physicality and 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 in relationship to being somehow sacramental. Um, uh, so it's not the first time that she's talked about it. Yeah, yeah. Also building off of uh, what Father Jonathan was saying there earlier of you know right wing media may have been poise for an attack from the get-go no matter what the album was going to be we were talking earlier about how um you know she's not the first secular artist to use religious imagery in a song but sometimes these songs get a free pass because someone in the group is a professing christian you two is probably one of the biggest examples of guys who throughout their entire career have been writing music that has religious imagery in it they're a secular band but bono is catholic or uh I'm trying to think of Lifehouse would be another, you know, another popular early 2000s group that the lead singer and I think a couple of the other guys were Christian. So they have like some very clearly Christian songs and no one really thought much about it. But it's it seems like because Taylor has never expressed any kind of like religious anything before. Fact nope, check. No, that's not okay. true. Okay. She, yeah. I mean, growing up, she... <laughs> I don't know what she would say she identifies with. Um, I'm glad now. I said fact check. Uh, but in uh, in the documentary she made, Miss Americana, she says, because she's talking about, mm-hmm. like, this is what people in Tennessee who are Christian want. And she was like, yeah. I live in Tennessee. I'm Christian. That's not me. So mm. yeah. that it's, you know, a mm. little bit older. So maybe she does or does not identify that way any longer. But I mean... I think she I think she grew up in a Christian background. I do believe when I was in like middle school, high school, it was like, oh, Taylor Swift's a Christian. You know, her and the Jonas Brothers right, right. Uh, okay. were, you know, they were OK I because they're that. Christians, even though that. they're not Christian bands. You can still listen to them yeah. because they have purity rings or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think she's like more casually Christian, like most people who think of themselves as Christian. Um, I'm hoping not to let this conversation get too off the rails here. Um, one, masturbation is a tricky subject, whether or not we think that's okay or not, or if that's what she's talking about. That's a whole other thing. It doesn't seem like she's talking about watching porn specifically. So it's kind of like, I uh, shrug. There's a lot of different theological diversity around whether or not masturbation is okay. I don't know, man. Um, 
but <laughs> specifically, I, I mean, what's weird is I feel a little bit like a hypocrite because I, I really have a disdain for the Florida Georgia line song, Florida, Florida Georgia line song that's uh, holy. That's talking about love being something that's holy to them. Um, yeah, but they and holy use represents as an acronym, acronym to mean yeah. high on loving you. Yeah, I was gonna say it was an acronym, uh, and it still bugs me. That uh, that song just bugs me. <laughs> I'm just like, wait, that's not just, what holy means. Stop. Um, <laughs> song, but you know, I and part of this does irritate me a little bit. I, I think the the thing though is Taylor's very clearly in my mind not making theological statements, but saying what she feels, and I think it's important for those of us in ministry and not in ministry to realize this is how a lot of people feel. They feel like a lot of Christian culture or people who say that they're Christians are saying, all you're doing is sin. This is a sin. This is a sin. This is a sin, blah, blah, blah. And attacking them. And they're like, well, I didn't do anything. How can I be guilty? I didn't do anything. Would you uh, liken, this is for everybody, not just Josh. Would you liken this song to take me to church by Hosier? That's a good song. That's different. (laughs) (laughs) I, uh, I mean, I mean that like that, that song popped into my head. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's the one where like, uh, where she's like, well, like, I think tonally it's the same. It might even be the same chord progression, but it's, um, where she's like describing the person as their, as her drug. I forget the name of that song. Oh, Oh, that's on reputation. I remember that one. Yeah, I know what you're talking about though. Oh, uh, don't blame me. Blakey. Yeah, don't blame me. But like, I think the chord progression like kind of lines up. I've heard like mashups with that. So like, I think I automatically kind of went into those kind of like those two songs together. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think like I think contextually like just I I don't like I although there's language like you know roll away the stone like crucify me and stuff like that I I honestly. Like I'm thinking about the criticism that she would actually be getting, like if she's writing this, and I don't think that she's looking. Like I don't think that it's religious. Like it's it's criticism that she would get for having feelings or having thoughts about another person or engaging in some type of relationship with another person, coming from like a like a, a religious group. I think it's just like like so much of her experience is has been being under the microscope because yeah. she is one of one of the biggest if not the biggest artists of, of like the last 10 years um and so so she's constantly being criticized uh, externally and I, so i yeah. and, and she's using the language of sin but i don't know that it's like it's it's like sin like a christian would understand the idea of sin as much as it's um yeah uh, as as it's much of like a like a social faux pas or something like that 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 she's saying um and like it's just happening in my mind but i'm not like going out there and doing it but like would it really be so bad if i just like like did this like just kind of engage this yeah. relationship even like despite what like what everyone says about it you know you can mm-hmm. take it for what it is about who she's talking about of um uh, this, this particular she's maybe um yeah and so um yeah so I, like that's it so that's the only thing like i would say is like it, it's challenging because this is language that like people are like familiar enough and i'm like i'm trying to like go back to like mm-hmm. i didn't grow up in the church or anything like that i kind of came to it like a little later and um you know, i wasn't like i saw the passion of the christ that was like the first time i really heard a story of the crucifixion but like i knew like this is the type of this is the type of language i would understand being unchurched and unfamiliar and they, yeah. they're just they're just catchy religiously sounding words when she's trying to like like use this language of original sin and crucifixion um and yeah. religiosity um but without actually without actually trying to like express something that is in any way those things um yeah at least that's how it's, that's how I'm 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 reading into the lyrics. Yeah, and for me, it helps to. Huh. This is this is man. This is just so on brand for me. I am on brand today, guys. Um, the four love C.S. Lewis favorite book, <laughs> etc. Um, <laughs> He's gonna get into that club one of these days. Um, the. <laughs> 
No, no. So it, it is my favorite book. And part of why is because like it just explains the human experience so fully and so well and contextualizes it in the gospel in a way that helps me make sense of life. Um, and it actually helps me make sense of this song a little bit. So in, in the book, he, he breaks down how all of our loves are more or less a reflection of the real ultimate love, which is God's love. So to think of our romantic loves and be like, man, it feels sacred. It feels holy. It, it should a little bit, right? Like it should because it is a reflection of something that truly is holy. So it makes sense in a way when she says, what if this is the thing that whole that is holy? I understand that feeling. Um, mm. I, I think it's only a reflection of what's truly holy. But I understand where that feeling is coming from. And I think she's describing a feeling and not saying it is holy. She's saying, what if this is what's holy? Because that's what she's feeling. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded as you as you said that. So there is a, uh, I want to say, 10th, 11th century saint. Um, his, his name is Saint Simeon, the New Theologian. And he wrote a series of poems called Hymns on Divine Eros. Um and oftentimes we, we when we think of divine love we're like kind of mm -hmm. thinking of agapic love like self-sacrificial love um and the, but he, he he kind of like and this kind of draws back into old testament like you know uh, the song of songs mm -hmm. kind of love like there is there there, there is a, a way in which erotic love uh of, like god loves us in a way that's erotically desiring us and we ought to, we are meant to have that same type of erotic love, this love that is desire and arrows um, towards God. And even like in some of the hymns, like he, like, like there is like, I don't want to say it's explicit, but like he, he likens the, the, the relationship of, of a, a human being to God to the, like the coupling relationship within the dynamic of a husband and wife. Um, and I mean, though that's just like Christian from you know a thousand years ago like 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 realizing that there is something in the human experience of um of this this particular type of love um that can speak to um can can speak to the dynamic of our our love for god and, and god's love for for humanity all right are you guys ready to go to through the album i know we're we're already an hour plus into this and i knew this was going to be long because we can't we can't not let this be long because it's taylor swift of all things what else does geeks talk about other than taylor swift she's got to do it for like 13 hours you know yeah yeah it's fine um all right if you guys are ready i want to jump in like i mentioned what we're going to do we're only going to talk about eight of the songs there are 31 songs so of course this was going to be a long episode um man 122 minutes of content but we are only going to talk about eight songs i'm going to start at the first song i'm going to list them off you guys say stop when you're at one you want to talk about um the only other rules here here's we go because they're my favorite songs are not going to be the two that i want to talk about so you get thumbs up thumbs down for those on youtube or if you need to say you can't do a whole sentence. You can do a half a sentence comment if you want of, oh, that's a good one. Or, mm, wish we could talk more about that. Something like that. That's fine. But not a full sentence. All right. <laughs> Unless it's your pick. <laughs> okay. Are we all good? Clear on the rules that aren't very rule-like and are more like guidelines? <laughs> He's still on the pirate thing. I sure am. Here we go. <laughs> Number one, Fortnite. Number two, the tortured poets department. Three, my boy only breaks his favorite toys. Perfect. That's my favorite. Four, down bad. Five, so long London. Okay, I want to talk about this one. All right, here we go. That <laughs> took long enough. <laughs> Ooh, I'm sorry. surprised we got to five. Um, so I liked this song, but the reason why I want to talk about it is because I feel like this is a really good example of I feel like everyone was kind of obsessing over like, who is this song about? Is this song about Joe? Oh my gosh. So many of these songs are about Maddie Healy and all of this stuff, even though she's like telling us like, oh my gosh, please stop talking about my dating life. Like, and so like, this is just one of those songs that I was like, 
like I guess on the surface everyone would just assume like oh yeah this song's just about Joe but I really liked this song because I feel like it really encapsulates that grow going through a breakup especially with like a long time partner it's you're not just losing that person she lost her life like she thought she was you know gonna be with this person and they were gonna live in london and she loved being there and she loved you know all of this stuff about her life and now she doesn't get it like she can't have that because she's the relationship's over and she has to say goodbye to all of that and to me like i don't know i just really thought that was a very powerful message of like so often I feel like breakup songs just talk about like oh I miss you and like the things about the person they don't really go into like just how devastating ending a long-term relationship can be and why it's so hard to end a relationship like that because there's a lot at risk and there's a lot to lose Mm. yeah yeah okay anybody have anything in response to that because that's uh I feel like she said that really well um there's a i mean there's a judah and the lion song that's like uh i don't remember the name of it but it's like the worst part of the breakup is trying to take these pictures off the walls mm-hmm. oh, yeah, that's yeah. uh yeah that that's rough you do love me some judah and the lion i yeah, forgot about them they're a great group oh yeah i think uh just like resonating with the idea of like it's not just like a life like you can lose an entire location mm-hmm. along with it um like i still have a hard time driving by the the house where i lived with my ex you know like it it was it was hard yeah i like think about like she's gonna go play a bunch of shows in london and like she's gonna do it because she has lots of fans there but like like there it's like forever anytime she goes back there for a tour or whatever like there's going to be a certain filter on it even if she's healed and everything that's gonna hold some emotions and stuff there so Mm-hmm. yeah man yeah no that's rough all right are we wanting to move on to other songs can we move on to other songs? <laughs> this this album's so rough man all right i'm gonna try to move on and let's see where we stop next but daddy i love him i like that one all right here we go oh yeah where's that? the is that a stop or is that a one? Yeah, it's a stop. I, 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 I right. didn't let us get very far. This one is the one like I've listened to the most uh, so far. And I think a part of it is like, like that country quality that was nostalgic for her early stuff. Um, but then also, and then also it's, it's, it is a, it is a, a story song, like in a, like, like it tells a narrative. Um, uh, not that other ones don't. But like this one, this like follows the pattern of the story, much like there like a lot of her earlier songs did. Um, and then part of it is like, yes, there's also these kind of like critiques of kind of like 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 some of the self righteousness that you see in some kind of like traditional conservative communities, and like this idea of like a wild young love um, that like. I'd say that's not something like I like personally relate to, but like I can I can understand how a person who's young and has like all these feelings um, like flowing through their head um, and and like and hormones and all of those things, like how how this scenario could play out, just not not totally understanding, and then like have it like switch towards the end, like it's a like it's it's like a natural relationship and like like things can work out um and so there was just so there was something about it that like i i feel like this is the type of like pastoral i like i could see myself having a pastoral conversation with someone who's who's like working through this and like how one like might expect you know i'm, I'm a priest in a pretty conservative orthodox christian <laughs> tradition that i uh, that i might like be the like a voice like that is the criticizing um uh of of like kind of the lifestyle choices of someone but but at this but but every ounce of my body and like my being as i if i were to be confronted with like an experience like this um would would 
be inclined to just try to understand where that person is coming from. Um, and like I like I felt a sorrow for this character, um, both because of what she was feeling, and then also with like the like how, what she was experiencing from like her family and like the church people and all of that. But then also like a sadness that like 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 this is this is the this is the emotional maturity level of like that this person is stuck at and not able to see like it's not just it's not oppressive there's like a, there's a reason why we have to be mindful of like how we give ourselves to another person because you know it may be beautiful and exciting now but we don't you, you never know um like like you don't know what what you're it, what will happen and what will like what will be taken from you like like not just like 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 uh, the parts of you that might be taken when something that is like exciting and crazy and mm -hmm. you know driving through fences um <laughs> in a relationship yeah. but like when you come off of that and you and you recognize how like life is harder than than just you know, people not thinking that it's okay for you to be with someone like there's, there's a, there are deeper heart hardships that come in the dynamic of a relationship and, the, you know, having been in relationships and having had them end, like I recognize, you know, the toll it takes, the, the, the pieces of you, you lose. Um, and you were, and even when you were like so certain and people around you were saying you oh, wasn't right. And then to like have that realization that maybe there was, there was a truth to it that you were unable to see because you were so, wrapped up in, in the infatuation of of this experience um so it's just like yeah. i just felt like a very powerful very real very believable story um that yeah that i could see myself like like caring for a person at any stage of, of what this story like was or, or could play out to be yeah yeah i am um... hey when we're talking about feelings and taylor swift songs i feel like you gotta get a little personal so I, i'm just gonna loose a little bit on this episode um i i'm made to think of I, I had an ex and and i did have a lot of people who told me like hey this isn't this isn't right this isn't whatever this isn't it josh and again to go back to c.s lewis there's that whole thing of the four loves of like if you let if you let it each love will become a god and when it becomes a god it becomes a demon that's something that he says over and over and over um you know friendship when you become so obsessed with friendship it ends up being about the friendship itself to the point that you're just excluding others and you're doing no good in the world so when it becomes a god it becomes a demon right um and, and he goes through and he does this with all this and, and the thing with romantic love is you can become so obsessed with one another that you lose everything else so when it becomes a god it becomes a demon um, and, and what's crazy is I look back at it and even to this day, I can't point and go, yeah, she was bad for me. Some stuff that literally no one could have foreseen happening happened that caused it to become something that we couldn't stay in that I tried to make happen anyway, just because everybody else was telling me that I, it, it was wrong for me. And I was like, well, the reasons you think are wrong are false. And since you're wrong, I'm going to stay in this relationship just to prove you wrong. And that became really, really toxic for me um, and led to a lot of terrible outcomes just because, well, you said I can't. And I know your reason why I can't is wrong. So let me be right. And let me show you that I'm right. Um, and yeah, that's uh, unhealthy and bad. And that's yeah. not what this song's about, but it brings up that feeling. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think I relate to what she's saying of just like, like I had an ex that like all of my friends and like that friends and family didn't really like like not that he was like bad but it was just like but I just wanted them all shut up because I was like but I'm happy why can't you just be happy for me like and I feel like yeah. that's kind of a little bit what she's getting at of like just um, stop talking about my dating life and let me do it on my <laughs> own yeah, yeah. Uh, we might talk about it later, but there's another song where she's like, uh, my good name is something for me to ruin. <laughs> like, you well, guys can butt out. <laughs> it's the same song. That's this song. Good, good. That's a good one. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I don't know all the songs yet, guys. I've only listened to it like three or four times. Anyway, um, All right. Is everybody good to keep going down the list? <laughs> all right. Here we go. Fresh out the slammer. Florida. Boo. 
thumbs, where's my thumbs down? Um, guilty as sin. We already talked about that one. <laughs> Who's afraid of little old me? I can fix him. No, really, I can. L-O-M-L. It's a sad song. I can do it with a broken heart. Me. <laughs> oh, I was going to <laughs> Thank God. This is, this is one of my favorites, but I don't have a ton to say about it. So I'm glad you do. <laughs> Yeah, so like I said, I only I've only listened to the album the one time so far. So I don't really I don't have a lot to say. I don't have a lot to say about many of the songs. Um, but when it comes to this one, I think this will be the one that ends up being my favorite from the album. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, the ones that are a little bit more about like identity seem to hit with me better. And there's a lot of that in this song there's some of that in this song um of just like it's very relatable of you got your heart ripped out and you have to still go to work now for her going to work is being on stage in front of thousands of screaming fans and having to pretend like you're happy while you're up there and that's very different than me having a bad day at home cooper being very fussy and then i have to go to work where i teach children so you know it's not a good one-to-one it's apples and oranges but it, it's still very it's again kind of like trying to relate this to just personal experiences of like you know everyone has had that time where you're depressed you're anxious you're whatever and yet you're still expected to go do a thing I did my grandfather's funeral back in November. I, you know, my family, my dad came to me and wanted me to uh, put the service together, to preach, to do the graveside. And because I love my family, I did it. But it was a very awkward grieving experience. And, mm. you know, again, just kind of that like, People are, as we just got done talking, you know, people like watching everything you do in your dating relationship and then your heart gets broken and you have to go on say, stage and sing about how, you know, tonight it's a good night to, you know, I'm feeling 22 and all this kind of stuff, even though like your heart's ripped out. I know, I know sh when you're talking about Taylor Swift, you shouldn't bring up Katy Perry, but when uh, Katy Perry had like a concert movie come out years ago and uh, part of the movie was showing when Russell Brand sent her the text message that they broke up. Like that's how he broke up with Katy Perry. It was like through text moments before she's about ready to go on stage and do this big like show. And you just see her like backstage just sobbing and it's three, two, one. And she goes, just like puts on this big cheesy grin and just goes into the show. Um, Plus, I just really like the line. It's very catchy and trendy on social media right now. The I'm so depressed. I pretend it's my birthday every day or something like that. <laughs> you know, Great line. It, that's a very it, the pop punk guy. Like, I, I find that to be a very pop punk line. Like I could I could hear Paramore sing an entire song revolving around that line. So I, I love the line of. I'm miserable and nobody even knows. Yeah. Like where she sounds extra line. Barbie for that. And I'm like, that's perfect. My favorite is I cry a lot, but I am so productive. And I was like, yeah. And every millennial said, amen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I have a, a pretty public role and I've having gone through like, uh, like a, a, the end of a relationship in the midst of like a very public ministry mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was, you know, quite challenging and, and, I had oft, oftentimes had to like pretend everything was okay when I was like, I felt like I was dying on the inside, um, you know, and, um, and so like this, this really kind of very much resonated with experiences that I had. I mean, it's like not, no one's expecting me to make, you know, hit marks in stilettos, but um, I <laughs> certainly, um, there were certainly aspects of it. And then this was just like, I, I uh, I don't want to like go on too long because I know we're pressed for we have a short amount of time. But I recently um, had, like have been getting into like old anime shows and stuff like that. And for whatever reason, like the slice of life romance ones are just kind of like popping up in my oh. my you know proposed uh, <laughs> things. And there was one I think it's a, it's it's a, it, it's based on a web webtoon um, called The Girl Downstairs. 
and um and then there's an anime and then there's like a, a one season um live action k drama korean drama a version of it too and it's like this like kind of hmm. broken former pop star um who like like goes through this like existential crisis ends up like living like he gets dropped out by our manager in this like rundown like uh house like on campus of a university uh in seoul and um she ends up like meeting her upstairs neighbor and like they slowly fall in love and um and then she's like sued for copyright or, or sued for like breach of contract and she has to like go back into the pop star life uh, and in order to do that she has to like break up with the guy that she's seeing in the regular world um and it's just like it, 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 the different versions, like the, mm. the webtoon versus the anime versus the, the TV show. Like she's she's doing it like um, she's making all her marks. She's doing all her things. She's acting like she's fine. She even like uh, like wrote her entire album based on their love story and he never listened to it. And so like, mm. um, and so it's just, it's just like really tragic. And then she re- like at the end, like they, they get back together for a day and like she tells him that she has a boyfriend even though she doesn't so like this anyways long long story short like like it just i just saw that played out recently and it just kind of like it's like i can like i see i've seen that in multiple mm. media like what that can be like is you, you're like your whole life is on display and um and you have to pretend like you're ready to wow a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand people yeah. in a stadium yeah. when you're dying yeah. on the inside. Oh, that's a yeah. I note. Uh, I once broke up with a guy right before my shift at Chick Fil A, so I think I can mm. understand what Taylor <laughs> is going through right now. Yeah, that, that's exactly the same for sure. No, <laughs> no, but like, like I, man, I get it. Like sometimes it feels the same, and that, that's one thing when we're talking about feelings, like. What to I'm going to make myself to be the wuss in this situation for me, like stubbing a toe might make me feel like my life's falling apart and I might feel the same emotional weight that Brandon feels after literally everyone he's ever met has been kidnapped by aliens and he's left on the planet alone. You know, like like our emotions aren't necessarily one to one. Like Brandon might just be that much tougher than me. (laughs) Uh, uh, tough's not really the word tough's not the right word i'm not trying to belittle anyone else's feelings it's just one of those when we're talking about feelings like if you relate and your thing seems smaller than taylor's thing it's fine i promise taylor's not upset about it god's not upset about it we're not upset about it it's cool yeah <laughs> just as a last note on that like i always tell people like i do, like i never tell people i know how they feel i said I don't know yeah. what it's like to go through what you're going through, but the feelings that you're describing and the thoughts that you've told me you're thinking, I have both felt and got those, felt those feelings and thought those thoughts before. Um, and that's yeah. like the idea of empathy. Like, I don't know what you're going through, but I know what it can feel like to feel those things. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, one of my favorite professors, who's also a mentor of mine. Um, yeah. He, he broke that down for me because I always thought it was really comforting thing to say is like oh i know what you're feeling is like don't ever say that because here's the thing even if you went through literally the same thing you didn't go through it as them so you don't know what it feels like for them i was mm-hmm. like oh man and with that we're moving on <laughs> number 14 the smallest man who ever lived i hope that's a double entendre <laughs> number 15 the alchemy <laughs> Number 16, Clara Bow. Moving on to track the uh, album two, disc two. Number 17, The Black Dog. That's a good one, by the way. Number 18, I'm going to get you back. Wow. There's no spaces. I, yeah, I felt like that's just the appropriate way to say it. Correct. <laughs> uh, number 19, The Albatross. Also fantastic. Really? Uh, number 20, Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus, I'm going to stop us here. I'm going to talk about this one. Oh, okay. I loved this song. It connected with me on so many levels, a lot of which are just not what Taylor meant at all. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, so so it, from my understanding in the song, it feels like she's talking about someone who left her and she and he's with somebody. I don't even remember the name who they're with. You know, Chloe, Sam, Sophia, somebody. Right. Um, and, and it's it, I, I love the chorus. A it's just so emotional and raw and just like I just feel it. The if you want to break my cold, cold heart, just say I loved you the way you were. If you want to tear my world apart, just mm. say you've always wondered. So why this song connects with me, uh, and this is going to get a little weird, maybe. Um, I'm brain damaged. Fun fact. <laughs> uh, after my accident, I, I have about two years right before the accident that are really, really fuzzy for me. I don't remember all the details. Um, and during that time, I had a very serious relationship that I just barely remember. And what I do remember, it almost feels like someone else's story. It's like, you're telling me this thing happened. And I'm like, cool. Some guy named Josh Knoll dated some girl named blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm like, that's interesting. Like, it feels like you're just telling me a story, even though, like, I do have memories that that happened, but it doesn't feel like it happened to me. Hmm. So this whole thing of like Chloe or Sam or whoever, it's like, yes, this resonates with me because it's like, I don't know this person. Like, I, I know the name. I, I know what happened. I don't know this person. And for me, for a long time, um, probably up until I met my wife, because once I met my wife, I realized it doesn't matter because I love you and I love the life that I have. But up until that moment, I struggled with what if this person who I don't really remember said, I always loved you or I've always wondered what if things were different? So I'm like, I, I don't even know what happened. What do you mean if things were, different? you know, like, like, so for me, that's always been a subject of like. I don't know because I truly don't remember. So my feelings are so complicated around that relationship because I don't remember the relationship. Um, and even at one point I reached out and was like, I think I need to meet up. I'm brain damaged. This happened to me. I need to know what happened. And I basically got rejected on the invitation to figure out what happened. So that that's uh, for me, a very sensitive point. And this song really put feelings to that, even though I don't feel exactly the same now because I'm married. I'm like, doesn't matter what happened it still puts feelings to words to feelings that i didn't quite have words for and i found that really helpful for me so i really like this song for that reason even though again definitely not what taylor intended she wasn't like someone out there has like bad memories and has brain damaged and needs this song like you know like that's not what she was doing here but it really did help me put words to um to, to those feelings and um I don't know. Still sensitive. Uh, this album's really new for me, so it's just one of those like, man, I really teared up, and it's weird tearing up about a relationship that you don't actually remember. <laughs> so it's like, hmm, I don't know. Felt something at one point, I guess. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. I know you were being respectful towards the person you were dating but when you said blah 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 all i could think of was that episode of how i met your mother <laughs> where they can't remember the girl's name so they kept calling her blah blah and even like the character yeah, that was great her name was blah blah Hi, blah blah <laughs> that was a great episode though <laughs> oh man also how i met your mother really helps me work through emotions just in general that's a different episode for a different time <laughs> Josh yeah. and I have already done it twice, so yeah, we'll, we're we'll gonna do it again one sometime. I'd be, <laughs> we need I'd to create be our own. That. Challenge accepted. <laughs> oh man! All right, anybody have anything else to say about Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus? I just I don't get this song. Like I am constantly like looking up <laughs> explanations on to what this song means, and for some reason in my brain. I cannot figure it out. Like it does not <laughs> make sense to me. I'm just like, that's fair. Like it sounds very pretty. Like if I'm not like trying to figure out what the words mean and I just listen to it, I'm like, Oh yeah, I enjoy this song. But yeah. then I'm like, but what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually just funny. Yeah. I like, <laughs> we had very different responses. I'm not, I'm not a very tortured <sighs> poet, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> that's funny. All right, if we're good to move on, number 21, how did it end? Number 22, so high school. Oh, no, sorry. This is like one of my favorite songs on the album. I, I thought I this one was very it. Taylor Swifty. I could take this, it or leave it, you know. This song, for some reason, it just made me, 
it just put me into like a state of nostalgia of uh, just like I get that like being in love in high school because it's totally fake <laughs> for the most part <laughs> it's not all the time but you know but like just that like you don't have anything else to worry about so you just get to be in love and like just be with that person and like I don't know and like whether this song is about Travis Kelsey or not I know that's the rumor but like I don't know like it's just such a nice feeling and I like the sound of it to me it kind of reminds me of like almost like a sixpence none the richer Mm. sound Mm. like that's the vibes I get and I just really like it I also just first of all I love that she name drops Aristotle in this song I think that's fantastic (laughs) And yeah, I just yeah, also, I think the line, um, touch me while your boys play Grand Theft Auto. I think that that's fantastic, too. So, yeah, I don't know. That is funny. I just like the song a lot. The reason I, I, I did my so-so hand motion, um, I, I try not to dis- dislike song. See, see, so I have the opposite problem. So you, you can love something because you know the context and you're like, ah, blah. And like, sometimes I get too wrapped up in the context of the songs. I don't like Travis Kelsey. It's not that I don't like him and Taylor together. I just, I think he's an annoying individual. So I'm just like any song that I think might be about him. It's hard not to be biased. Viva Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. This is a big sticking point for a lot. I'm sorry. Are you going to sit here and tell me that you would act differently if you had just won the Super Bowl? Absolutely. 100%. No. I would have at least said we're going to Disney World, damn it. But he doesn't go to Disney World. He doesn't he That's didn't his go, fault. So why would he That's say that? That he could do better. He could go to Disney no. World. I'm sorry. Also, he just comes off like like that high school football player, jock, frat boy kind of person. And I'm like, I just This is literally that. everything that Claire's that. bestie said about why she doesn't like Travis Kelsey. So we have come it's, to the it's more of a vibe than why, anything. Why honestly. people don't like Travis Kelsey is because he likes to have fun. It's literally just the vibe. That's all. Like I had nothing against him as a person. I don't know. I'm him. sorry. I mean, she could continue to date British twinks, but you know, that would be better. No, it wouldn't. Clearly. <laughs> I like British twinks. Give me some B- Benedict cucumber patch. Come on. Benadryl cabbage patch. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, are we good you to move on from this one? Or? 1975 guy was a bad idea, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That that was that was bad. But okay, she did tell us that it's not up to us to ruin her reputation. It's her her right to do. It's her right to do that. Yeah, and yeah, to yeah, take yeah, her yeah. reputation back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Taylor's version. Okay. Are we are we good to move on from this? Yes. No. <laughs> I'm mad. <laughs> okay, number 23. I hate it here. Number 24. Thank you, Amy. I'm gonna stop at this one. <laughs> Even to the extent of how she named the song was just freaking genius. <laughs> like, like, here's the thing. Like, I try not to be the kind of person who pits up you know, pity or anger or anything towards others. Like I try to be forgiving and caring or whatever, but sometimes you just need a song. That's like, you know what? F that person. F you. <laughs> Look, I'm like, I love this. Um, she, she capitalized the K I M. And even at one point in the song is like, your kids are going to come home singing this. Cause they're not going to know who it's about. And I'm just like, I love Taylor for this. <laughs> Like the amount of pity okay. and just anger. And I'm just like this, this is what I need. Like, like whenever someone just makes me mad, I can see myself listening to this being like, oh, Taylor got him. <laughs> it just makes me feel good. You know, I have a theory. I don't okay. normally like okay. to get into like the Taylor Swift uh, theories good, and stuff, <laughs> but I have a theory that the reason why she has this song because it's like seems like different like this is all about like the time period after she broke up with joe and getting in with maddie and being sad and upset and depressed and mentally unstable and like all of a sudden she's like oh yeah and that thing that happened with kim kardashian however many years ago (laughs) i'm still mad um but actually i think what it is is that she's currently working on reputation her version and so it's in her brain and she hasn't been able to get to this album because like first of all it's the first album with all the songs about joe um Mm -hmm. you know it's about their the beginning of their love and so 
And then a lot of it is also has to do with this feud with Kim and Kanye. And so she had to heal from those things before she could release Reputation Taylor's version. And at the end of this song, she says she realizes that if it weren't for what they did, she would not have any of this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so and I mean, made peace with it. So I think Rep, Rep Taylor's version's coming soon. That's all I got to say. Yeah. Maybe in a fortnight. Um, maybe. So that'd be, that'd be great. I, I oh, man, e- even like how this song builds, this is going to sound weird, but it reminds me of Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. <laughs> because it's like, like, at, at first, you it's, are in full form tonight. <laughs> at first, it's like maybe she said it was my fault. Man, you know, it's not my fault. And then it's eh, maybe it's my fault. And then it's, it's probably my fault. And then by the end of the song, it's like, yeah, it, it was me. I did it. It's my fault. Like, that's how Margaritaville builds. And she builds this with like, F you, I'm mad. And it's like, well, maybe if you didn't do it, I wouldn't be here. And I was like, actually, if you didn't do it, I probably wouldn't be here. And by the end, she's like, thanks, jerk. <laughs> And you're like, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, I I just love it. And even still, like, there are points where, like I look back on like people who did me wrong or hard times I've been through. Not even necessarily people, even hard times that I just like was mad at the situation that I now am able to look back and be like, yeah, I wouldn't be here without that. Thank you, hard times, <laughs> or f you, hard times. So, yeah, it depends on the day. Oh man! All right, anybody else have anything to say about? Thank you, Amy. Kim's version. Kim's. <laughs> All right. Should we Wait. expect a rebuttal from Kanye? <laughs> They're divorced. Uh, well, let's not still, even. Still, Kanye is Kanye. So, or whatever That's his true. name is currently. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Number twenty-five. I look in people's windows. Easily her creepiest song. <laughs> if Weird Al does not do a cover of this, I'm disappointed. Oh uh, my gosh! Yes. <laughs> number twenty-six. Has he ever done it? Uh, do you have a Taylor Swift song? No idea. He's supposed to get permission. So I wonder oh. if she's never he he <laughs> likes to give permission. He doesn't have to. He just chooses to do that that way. Okay. Um number 26, the prophecy. Number 27, possibly my favorite, Cassandra. 28, my other favorite, Peter. Number 29, the Bolter. No, that's my favorite. Number 30, Robin. Number 31. The manuscript. All right. So I think all three of you still have one more song you have to pick. Uh-uh, I did two. You did two? In high school. Yeah. I did. Oh, yeah. So okay. That, that's true. That's true. Did... Just Brandon and Jonathan still have another song they have to, to pick. Jonathan, which one do you want? Uh, I don't, do I don't, Fortnite. I feel like none of them like struck like I, I didn't get enough time with any of them. Like as you were going through, like I was trying to think of like if there were any ones that struck me. Um, and I just I didn't have enough time to like sit with any more than the like the one that I mentioned or the ones we've already discussed. So then I'll I'll break the rules. I'll pick the third and it'll oh, be I was gonna go. I was gonna go. I have a second. Oh, will you pick Fortnite? I'll talk about I'll talk a little bit about Fortnite. Okay, fine. I'll just circle back to the beginning and talk a little bit about Fortnite. Um first off, nice to see you post Malone. Second, yes. um <laughs> the the song is good the song is good i'm assuming this will be the radio hit one uh, i actually want to talk more about the music video because i'm one of those people who like watching music videos and uh, uh, Post malone is so handsome without tattoos it blew my mind i was like wow i thought you were <laughs> ugly sir <laughs> that was rough <laughs> oh <Sorry>. she's ugly <laughs> um yeah i i'm i would be really interested to see if uh first off if she does something i don't think she's done before of starting to make interconnected music videos and if all of the videos related to this album will like tell a long form story i think that would be be kind of cool um love the aesthetic josh this one's for you i was getting major moon night vibes from this yes (laughs) hey um wait, wait it's over here right there that's Jonathan Hickman's signature on a Moon Knight comic right nice. there, sir. Good to see you, Mooney. Um, but uh, I, I, it does make me... So apparently we found this out that this song has is a multiple layered meaning to it. And one of them is that this is a reference to a 18th, 
1800s poet i can't remember a, a poet 20th century 20th century poet who had a sylvia plath S- sylvia plath th sylvia plath who had a similar kind of story to taylor swift they're actually both like considered to be very overrated in their genre but also very popular oh. um and she had a very tragic end and part of her life story is that she spent time in a mental institute like she does in this uh taylor swift does in this video and um it just makes me really appreciate as somebody with mental health you know you read about how they used to treat mental health issues you know as somebody with like depression and anxiety you you read about or you see like movies or read stories about how they used to treat it and yeah there's a lot of bad stigma still out there and yes the church still is way behind in how they could be taking care of people in the mental health community but my word shock therapy lobotomies like i would have had it both done to me by this point if i was alive in the like early you know 1900s and the late 1800s they i would have you know they would have called a priest they would have called father jonathan to try and perform an exorcism and if that wouldn't work they would have shocked me and if that would have worked they would have <laughs> lobotomized me and it just really breaks mm. my heart for i mean all jokes aside like it really does break my heart of how we used to treat people who were hurting and you know yeah. that's part of the music video is like they do like this electroshock therapy on taylor swift um and it really does just like break my heart like how we used to treat people yeah. um you know like i said there's still pockets here and there of stigmas and issues but man it used to be bad it used to be so bad and uh, I know that doesn't really have so much to do with the the song, more so like just like reflections from the video, but also a form yeah. of art. So, yeah, no, no, no. I agree with all that. Um, I, I think for me, the thing that if I was to talk about Fortnite, I and, and this does kind of tie into some of that, too, is how much pain can be inflicted in a small period of time and how we don't have the right to say, oh, well, that was just, you know, just a phase or that just was, you know. However, and this goes back to the original thing we were talking about like earlier on of how like what happens to me, even if you go through the same thing, might not feel the same for you. And that's why I like I feel like it's so important that she brings up maybe this relationship didn't last so long for her, whatever she's talking about. But man, it hurt just the same. Um, And I'm reminded of like David Tennant, his time as the doctor, you know, he wasn't the doctor for very long. He wasn't the 10th doctor very long. Burned bright, burned hot, and man, yeah, it made a huge impact on the doctor's life. Uh, and yeah, there's like points in my life that are like, yeah, man, I, I was in Charleston for like two years of my life. I'm 30 years old. Like that's not a ton of my life, but man, a lot of my life was shaped and formed around that time. You know, so it's it's like, even though something to you might seem like it was just a fortnight, it wasn't very long. It shouldn't be that big a deal. Maybe it is to them. You know, true. Yeah. If I was to steal a third song from somebody, fr- sorry, Father Jonathan, if I'm stealing his other song, uh, I'd choose Peter just because I like any song that references Peter Pan makes me happy. It's pretty simple. <laughs> just uh, just I love the Peter Pan story, especially like the original story and like ha- how the way it ends of like not Disney version, how much more tragic it is that all the Lost Boys go with her and everybody does grow up except for Peter and he keeps going back. And he actually forgets who all of them are. And it's one of those like, yeah, when you're a child, it's like you don't even remember this thing. But if you grow up how you're supposed to be, the scars stick with you, you know, Uh, and I like that, too. I like that. But also, I just like Peter Pan. It's mostly that. (laughs) Nice. Okay. Talk about the Jehovah Witness suit. Yeah, we we don't need that. Space war. That's in small. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, guys, uh, we're, we've been on this for a very long time and haven't rated the album. Zero to ten, everybody, just if you have any like quick thoughts with it, you can. That's fine. But just so we get it out of the way, I don't know, guys. Uh, for me, this felt like a very average Taylor Swift album. I, I liked how she picked a little bit of all of her eras. It didn't, to me, it doesn't feel like there's a, a tortured poets department era. It feels like some of these songs felt like they could have been in 1989. Some of them felt like they could have been in folklore. Like it feels like she just kind of picked and choose from other eras. 
So she didn't break any new ground as far as I'm concerned. So that's the thing that I was like, man, I wish we had a new vibe in this, like a whole new feeling for Taylor. And I feel like we didn't get that. So I'm kind of disappointed. But a lot of the songs I really do like. So I'll give it like a six out of ten, maybe seven, six or seven. That's how I'm feeling. It was OK. A lot of the songs were great. A lot of them were just felt like another Taylor Swift song that I could have mistaken for a song on a different album and maybe an extra. Um, Brandon, you go. Yeah, I'll I'll echo that. Of I think just like a nice solid six. I know on a ten point scale that's not great, but it was just it was a fine it was a fine album. Like you said, kind of sound it sounded like Taylor Swift music. You know, I don't know how else to put it. I actually found because a lot of these were so slow and uh, melodious, I felt like a lot of times you could end a line by saying champagne problems. Like it it really fit into a lot of the songs. So yeah, like (laughs) I get that idea of this could have been like parts of several different eras. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Claire, we'll let you go next. Um, I think I, it's probably about a six or a seven for me. I think if, we didn't have the second half of the album and only the first half. I might put it a little bit higher just because I personally liked the first half better. Um, But she didn't. So, but um, I think she, the purpose of this album was for her to just let it all out to close the book Mm -hmm. on this chapter and to just be done and now she can move on and she can you know Mm -hmm. she's you know process through it so i think her next album will be maybe a bit more like back to her like wanting to experiment and stuff i just don't yeah think that was the purpose of the album i think she just needed to write and process and focus more on like the feelings rather than the music. So she stuck with what she knew and what was safe. Yeah. And then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, totally checks out. I mean, other than the first half thing, but that's fine. <laughs> You're wrong. I know. It's okay though. I'm used to being wrong. <laughs> Father care. Jonathan, take us home. Zero to 10. How do you feel about this one? Oh, I, I don't, I don't have a feeling yet. Um, <laughs> fair. That's fair. I, yeah. I, I got like, like I, 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 um, like, so this is like the clo- like the close of our Lenten season. Um, cause, cause our Easter is, um, mm-hmm. a week from Sunday. So like, we're right in that period of time where like most of the time I was listening to this, I was driving between like visiting our homebound parishioners mm-hmm. before Easter, uh, doing like a, I think I've done like over a dozen uh, confessions in the last um, like three or four days. So it's just like, like I've been listening to it, but, um, but I'm, I've been listening to it just kind of like emotionally, spiritually drained. Cause it's a, it's a lot to, to bear yeah. the pains and, and stuff of, of so many people uh, while, <laughs> while I'm bearing my own pain. But um, mm-hmm. uh, so I, I don't have a, a ranking. I, I think that um, in many ways, it, like a lot of it is what I think I needed to hear right now. Um, and what that means in terms of where I rate it. Uh, I just I just don't have a, a, a number for it. But I, uh, I think I will be listening to it for the next little bit. And I think um, I think it, uh, it's on the positive end of the spectrum. And it, it's, you know, certainly above the middle, but I don't, I don't know exactly where it's going to land until yeah. I've actually had time to listen to 31 songs enough to <laughs> even be able to yeah. recognize what song by name was about what. So that True. that's also fair. Yeah. We all agree. It's above middle. Yeah. We're all terrible content creators too. We're supposed to have hard, <laughs> hot takes, even though it's thirty-one songs. Ever. You know, if that's what you wanted. I can give you some hot. Take. <laughs> give me a hot take, real quick. Do you have one offhand. Offhand. Uh, Cassandra's one of her best songs ever. No. <laughs> I, I, I had this like first we feast vibe. This camera, this camera, this camera. Roll out the red carpet. Um, I, mean, I think, like we talked about earlier, like "Me" is not a bad song, 
people who don't like it just don't like having fun. That's true. That is an accurate statement. I agree, <laughs> but I have bad opinions, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> you do have some bad opinions, yeah, but that's yeah. okay. Everybody has bad opinions. <laughs> All right, guys, before we wrap this up, I want to see, do you guys have any other thoughts um, either around the album or just the idea of like how much this music is focused around relationships and breakups? Is it like idolizing relationships or do you think it's like healthy that we have this kind of thing as an outlet or do we not have any thoughts about this at all? Just want to move on. I'll say this. She's I she's made a career, I'll air quote that, of writing about, you know, breakups mm-hmm. and being upset that Maggie Gyllenhaal Hall still has her scarf or something. But um <laughs> sorry. That's funny though. But uh this one's different. If if there's anything tor- tortured poets department does well. Um, that is different from all the other breakups, all the other this is that it is very raw. It is very like, but not in a, you know, not in a bitter kind of sense, not in a F you kind of sense, not in the immature. That's the word I'm looking for. Not in like this immature sense. Like it is a very mature exploration of very difficult feelings and yeah. acknowledging that like relationships you know when there's a breakup like it might not be just like this black and white you hurt me like it can cause like we talked about with the so uh so long london like loss of an entire life loss of an entire memory loss of an entire you know pl- um, continent or whatever the uk like whatever like you know it's complicated and i feel like this album does a very good job of communicating that like we said you know is it her best album of all time i think all three all four of us would be pretty confident to say not particularly at least not our favorites of all of her albums but i think as an album that explores very complicated emotions in relation to breakups, this is a very mature album in that sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's necessary, even if it's not the most fun or most beautiful. Sometimes we just need to hear someone else go through the complicated stuff. Cause mm-hmm. we're tired of it. <laughs> it. I, I do have to say like, so uh, I don't know how Josh, you said you're 30, but like, I don't know how old everyone is. So I'm like, I'm about to turn 37. So I'm like kind of, getting to like I like I'm about to enter my late 30s and um and I've been thinking a lot like just the idea that like this is a a woman in her like early to mid 30s reflecting on life and breakups and all of those things versus the 15 year old girl that started this this career or like the girl in her early 20s or Mm, mid 20s like 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 it's it it, we're, we're constantly re-reflecting on the experiences and the themes and and the, like the wisdom that has come through a you know a life in the world um and i, I think that like the, the reality like like i've grown along with her because you know we're just a few years yeah. apart uh, in age um and the, like I, I was i've just been talking recently i don't know if this like has to say about like oh do we need breakup songs or anything like that i mean like the reality is like that's one very big aspect of like what most people's lives are like you know it's in a very yeah. you know it's it's um you know yes we have our careers yes we have you know you know other struggles yes you know awful things are going on in the world right now but like like it is it is a it is a common human experience from age to age is how we feel the relationships we have longing and love and all of those things um but one of the things I, I was saying is, uh, and, and you kind of alluded to it, I forget who said it, but like the idea of like very young ways of thinking are very black and white. And I'm reminded of like, um, there's this Catholic thinker, uh, Richard Rohr, and he talks about like, it was like, I think in Falling Upwards, like something about the two halves of life. And he was saying there's first half of life thinking is is very black and white, yes, no, um, this or that. Um, and uh, the second half of life thinking is marked by an ability, capacity to be with ambiguity mm-hmm. um, and and to feel all the stuff that you feel in the midst of that ambiguity, but not say, you know, not say 
not exist in a way where it has to be this or that black or white. Um, mm. but, but be aware and live into the reality that life is more textured and complicated and messy and uncertain um, yeah. than can be can be experienced when you're 15, 20, 25, 30. And even when you're like in your late 30s and you just haven't, you haven't, you haven't grown emotionally mature enough to be in that place where you can be okay with ambiguity. Mm. Yeah. 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 Just to kind of like put it into perspective, we started with picture the picture to burn and now we're at so long London. Like if that doesn't show some form of like, maturity of growth in processing emotions like i will say though if you're ever just having a bad day you turn on picture to burn and (laughs) sing it and like that southern twang she has in that first album it's yeah it's very healing (laughs) i'm gonna tell you that i i find immense hope in some of her songs especially the folklore ones like invisible string i'm thinking of like uh, yeah, it's just there are so many different feelings and so many complications around it. And usually it is around like romantic parts of your life. And, and here's where, man, I hate to follow up you guys, but also I'm going to call back to the four loves because, you know, C.S. Lewis favorite books, four loves. Um, you know, that's my that's my thing, I guess. <laughs> but um, when we talk about how all of the human loves are just reflections of the divine love, the the better love. Um yeah, I, I think how we process breakup and how it feels, that pain says a lot about our love with God and when we choose other things. Um, am I equating a romance to you know true religion and God and saying this is just as important as God? Absolutely not. But I think it should tell us something. This hurt now, this temporary hurt with our relationships tells us something about the divine and what it means when we choose something else other than love um, and maybe not romantic love I'm talking about here, but you, you know, I think there's a correlation there and I think it should allow us to think deeper. Hey, Hey, sometimes you just need to be upset that you went through a bad breakup. Sometimes you just need that. And that's good. But sometimes I think it's okay to take it a little bit further and even contemplate, Hey, this is not about God, but what does my feelings in this kind of love tell me about the divine love? And just kind of think about those things. I think it's also a healthy meditation practice, perhaps. Okay. Any other comments, thoughts? Um, just a, just one last thing. It, it's uh, I'm going to go deep back many centuries. There is a, a a writer, uh, Basil of Caesarea, Basil named Basil the Great, and he wrote. Um, a series of treaties to young men on the value of Greek letters. And it's not just about like learning Greek language, but it's about, um, uh, it's about the value in like, like even engaging with things like, like Greek, ancient Greek philosophy or classical uh, or ancient Greek, like um, um, mythology and ethic uh, epics and stuff like that. Um, and it reminds us to like, to, to be like the bee, who searches for the good pollen and not like the fly who swarms around the garbage. Um, and it is possible for us to even in things that stand, but look as, as though they appear to stand in opposition to something that we might hold to be of ultimate significance as, as Christians, as people of faith, there is always a capacity in something, um, even in, our recognitions of its shortcomings in relation to ultimate reality to to be transformed and to come to a better understanding of that which is good and beautiful and loving and perfect Mm -hmm. come to a deeper appreciation for god um even in just our recognition of 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 how 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 this particular thing can come up short Mm. man yeah amen hallelujah i don't have anything else I'm going to go ahead and go to the wrap up for this one. Guys, we like to end with a recommendation. And just like I did in the beginning, I'm going to wreck our plans for recommendations and say it has to be music related. Recommend me another album other than the Torture Poets Department. It doesn't matter if it's Taylor Swift or not. Just another album. Um, I'll start because I kind of mentioned it earlier. Judah and the Lion pep talks fantastic album not my favorite album but man it's so good it's so 
emotionally rich and also fun. Um, so I think it's a good one. I got to uplift that, shout that out. Um, Claire, I'll let you go next. Do you have an album you want to shout out? Um, so other than Taylor Swift, my other favorite artist is probably Panic at the Disco. Mm, um, good. And I would say my favorite of his albums, their album, whatever, um, is Too, Ri- Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die. Mm, so yeah. go check that one out. Good one, too. Um, Father Jonathan. Ooh, um, I'm thinking, I'm not sure Like if this is like something that everyone knows, but it's, it's something that I go back to. I just kind of like the sound of it. But um, the either uh, I and Love and You or The Carpenter by the Abbott Brothers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, man, that's, uh, that's also great. Excellent stuff. Yeah. <sighs> now I need to listen to more of them. Actually, <clears throat> they spent a lot of time in the North, in the Carolinas, so. We should go see them sometime. That's what we should do. Brandon. Hi. I will recommend Out of Time by R.E.M. It's from 94, 95, something like that. Uh, Losing My Religion, uh, Shiny Happy People, Country Feedback, a lot of good existential kind of religious-y songs, that uh, garage or uh, college rock sound. So go check it out. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, guys, thank you for listening to, I think, the longest episode of Systematic Geekology. You guys rock. Uh, we we had to. It's Taylor. What geekier subject is there than Taylor Swift? Um, Have you heard Swifties on TikTok? That's there's, true. That that's true. Hardcore. They get way more hardcore than hardcore most Star Wars game. fans I know even. So, yeah. And we didn't get that hardcore. We didn't go Star Wars or Swifty level or, you know, those Swifty levels. We went our own Swifty. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, all right. See, is Anakin Skywalker coded? I'm just going to. Oh, accurate, accurate statement. Go listen to the <laughs> prophecy. Think about Anakin Skywalker. Meditate on that. Um, and while you're doing it, go ahead and rate it and review our show on Apple Podcasts or on Podchaser. That helps us a lot. If you're on Spotify, hit the five stars, hit the bell so you get a notification for every episode we do. That would help a lot as well. Um, Again, I want to do a shout out to Jeannie Mattingly, You Rock. And of course, we want to remind everyone one extremely important thing, and that's to remember that we're all a chosen people. The Geekdom of Priest. Hi, uh, my name is TJ. I'm here to tell you about the Systematic Ecology Shop. That's where we post all of our merch. It is hosted on uh, Creator Spring. And we have a ton of really cool merch, uh, mostly clothing. We have hats, extra soft t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies, and more. Our hosts wear them all the time. It's actually super comfy. Uh, We have glassware, mugs, which everybody loves a good mug. Fill out your cupboard. Get rid of some old ones, which is the part that I never do. And that's why I have too many cups. Uh, we have cloth bags, posters, uh, and this, it's really stuff. We like to put our icons on there. We like to put quotes, uh, things we come up with. Uh, and it's cool. It's a cool way. And a lot of it is pretty subtle, too, uh, to show support for one of your favorite shows. And my personal favorite is actually our SG dad cap, which I've, <laughs> I haven't been reluctant to buy it because now I have to wear hats at work. And then I get tired of wearing hats, but it's really cool. It's really understated. It is our logo right here. And then it says systematic ecology on the back. It's great. It's a really good hat. We have a few of them floating around. Uh, Check it out. And if we could all just rock the the SG dad cap in public, I think that'd be pretty sweet. Hey, friends, this is your pal, Will Rose, and I have some exciting news. Systematic ecology will return to Theology Beer Camp this year, October 17th through the 19th in Denver, Colorado. And we hope that you can join us. We are part of Theology Beer Camp in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, at my home church in my hometown. And that year, Theology Beer Camp was called The God Pods. And then we were in Missouri, a part of the Geek Stage. Yes, we had a whole entire Geek Stage where we had workshops and speakers and had incredible conversations. And uh, Theology Beer Camp last year was called The God Pods 
strike back. So you kind of see where this is going. Uh, and so this year, the theme is the return of the God Pods. And so if you head over to Eventbrite and follow God Pods 2024, or hop over to Instagram, follow it there. And if you enter promo code Geekshire, <laughs> you see what we did there? Yeah. Wilbo Baggins approves. If you enter Geekshire, all caps, no spaces, you'll get $25 off your ticket price. Geekshire, all caps, no spaces. G-E-E-K-S-H-I-R-E. Yes, yeah, say it with me. Geekshire. Enter that. You get money off your ticket and you can join us and hang out and drink beer and have great food. And even if you don't drink beer, you can have uh, incredible uh, food and beverages and conversations with your favorite host here at Systematic Ecology. The Geek Stage is growing. I'm proud of that. And we thank Trip for this opportunity. We hope to see you at Theology Beer Camp, the return of the God Pods 2024.